Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Adrian. I'm an alcoholic. Ooh. You guys want to say a prayer? Just follow me, please. God, please allow me to be a hit. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Um, got like 45 minutes. I guess we'll get the director's cut right here. Um, I was born a long time ago, right, in a whole nother galaxy um, called Imperial County. <laughs> And um, 1971, to be exact, um, my father was a, a Vietnam veteran, uh, like I like to call him my Mexican Rambo. Uh, my mom grew up on a ranch in uh, Sonora, Mexico, and um, she didn't speak much English. Uh, uh, her, her, like her core belief was you work hard, believe in God, everything's going to be okay, right? And um, I don't remember being born. I don't think any of us do, but... Um, <laughs> From what I was told, there was a lot of crying involved, right? And it never stopped. Like, ever. Um, you know, I was born, I'm sure I was insecure. I'm sure I was selfish. I just wanted all the attention. And and um, and some things just never changed, right? And and um, I was super sick as a kid. I remember being in and out of hospitals. I had asthma real bad. Um, and um, I don't know... Uh, um, like, I don't know how that affected me as a whole, but I know that that's part of what happened, right? Like, I, 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 um, I couldn't play no sports. Uh, I remember I was, uh, they gave me a scratch test, uh, allergy test, and, and out of 117 things, I was positive for 98 of them. And, um, I remember the, 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 the worst one was they told me I couldn't eat potatoes and I cried, like, for days. <laughs> and, uh, we moved from, uh, Brawley to Calipat. Uh, I was like six years old and, um, and and I remember moving to this new town and, and new school and new friends and Circle K wasn't, you know, uh, on the corner and, and Feedy wasn't the next door neighbor and like all this different stuff was going on and and I remember feeling like just kind of not well, right? And and, and um, I remember the first day I went to school, we went outside for recess and uh, I was playing, they were playing, we were playing and then all of a sudden I looked up and I was in the sandbox and everybody was gone, right? And uh, so I went home, and um, <laughs> it's kind of how my mind works, right? Like, I don't really think about, like, going back to class or, you know, doing anything, right? Like, I'm just going to do what I do, right? And, and um, so I went home. You know, my dad he gave me an ass whooping or whatever, and, and, um, and, and, and you know, it just went like that, man. And, and I remember uh, being a kid and going to, like, Kmart. I don't know if you guys remember Kmart. They used to have this cafeteria. I used to love Kmart because they used to serve fried chicken there. And, um, and I'd be at Kmart, right? And, and, um, and I would just, I would steal things that I didn't need. And I don't know why. You know, um, I would act out in school. I never knew why. Um, like in second and third grade, uh, I ended up getting, uh, uh, sexually mishandled by a family member. And, um, that really screwed with me, right? And I remember acting out all the time and, and I would like yell at my mom and all this other stuff and, and, and thinking back like I wanted them to stop and I didn't know how to tell them. And so I used to act crazy, right? And, and the reason I talk about all this because it says that there are those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders and, and like some crazy stuff happened to me, right? And, um, like I don't know as a whole how it affected me, but I know that it did. And so I, I remember like that happening and, and right about that time, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, Space Invaders? <laughs> that came out and, um, if you weren't around at the time, like in 1977, 1978, my mom used to send me to Lee Starlight Market and, uh, a pack of cigarettes was 40 cents. And the video game used to cost 25 cents. So that was a fair piece of change, right? And, um, I was hooked. Like that was my first real addiction. Um, a lot of people always ask me, like, were you really hooked on these video games? And, and I'll tell you what used to happen, right? I put a quarter in this video game. I don't have to worry about the size of my ears. 
I don't have to worry about being sexually mishandled. I don't have to worry about my allergies and that I can't run, I can't play sports, I can't ride bikes, I can't do things like other people. I don't have to worry about the fact that, like, my dad suffered from PTSD and I don't know what I'm going to get when I get home. Like, I don't have to worry about anything but what's on the screen. So as long as I have quarters, like, my life's okay. Sound familiar? And um, it went from, like, Space Invaders to Star Castle to Defender Stargate. Like, um, you know, the video game might have changed. It might have gotten better. But the premise was always the same, right? I was hooked. And, um, you know, when I used to steal, I used to break into my neighbor's house. Um, his mom used to keep money in her, in her underwear drawer. And, um, you know, I'd go in there and steal. And I'd hear him, you know, get, you know, his butt whipped that night. And I felt bad, but not bad enough that I would stop. <laughs> and, um... You know, that carried on till about fourth or fifth grade. And, and um, like, I know this is Alcoholics Anonymous, but my story is a little complicated, right? So, um, you know, some of the homies, they started messing around with a little bit of, you know, weed or whatever. And um, I remember trying it. And it was good. Like, uh, you know, we'd smoke some. And, you know, we'd play Nintendo, eat some raviolis out of a big can. His mom worked at a restaurant. And, you know, we'd fall asleep or whatever. Like, that was okay. Like, it wasn't a big deal. And, um, you know, it was all right. I still like video games, right? And then junior high came around and, um, you know, we started messing with some different stuff and, uh, we started being able to party and, and, um, like I never really put an emphasis on alcohol because in my house, I forgot to mention that, uh, like my dad drank every day and, and, um, if I wanted to, I could drink with him. Like some of my fondest memories are my dad shining up his Harley Davidson. You know, he'd have a Tom Collins glass with Jose Cuervo in it and his drink was two ice cubes of Jose Cuervo, two fingers of tequila, one finger of water. And he'd drink, I drink, not a big deal. I remember getting sick, having like this crazy asthma attack going on, and he'd give me some some tequila with some lemon and some honey, and you know, and here drink this, and 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 so like I never really tripped on the alcohol, like it was just there. We drank, we didn't drink, whatever, like not a big deal. But um, this other stuff that was happening, like with the drugs and, and and peer pressure, and I wanted to fit in, and you know, and I I I I, I had all these other things happening in the house, and so when I got to junior high, like um, I stopped caring about school. I started hanging out with other people who accepted me and I started, you know, going out on parties and, and, and just doing a bunch of different stuff. And, and, um, what that looked like was, um, I'm always in trouble. I don't want to be at the house because my dad can't handle me. So I'm out on the streets and, um, I started having consequences. Like I'd end up at juvenile hall. You know, I remember the first time I went to the juvenile hall, uh, you know, Imperial County, everybody knows each other. And, uh, my friend's mom was the counselor there and, uh, she's like, come here. Come here, Mingo. Come here. Sit down. Sit down. We're going to call your dad right now. I'm like, all right, Miss Farrell. And she's like, all right. She puts up on. This is what I hear, right? She picks up the phone and she's like, Suko, Suko. Yeah, I got Adrian right here. No, I'm at the, I'm at the, I'm at the, uh, what is it? The, uh, juvenile hall? Yeah. Oh, you want him to stay here? Okay, it's $75 a day. Oh, you'll be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and, um, and, and that's what my life looked like. And when I got to high school, um, I, um, again, always in trouble. And, and, um, you know, I was staying at my aunt's house. She had four boys and two girls. The four boys were uh, all my age or older. And, and, um, like it probably wasn't the most productive place for me to be at, but that's where I was staying at. And, um, I never went home. Um, my dad, he stopped trying and, and, um, and I was kind of thankful for that. And um, I ended up getting a job at a local liquor store. Calipatria's got 2,000 people. So, like, at this liquor store, like, that's the only thing happening in town, right? And um, I got a job there. And, and uh, so alcohol was easy for me to get. And I kept drinking. I kept partying. I kept getting in trouble. I, you know, have run-ins with the police or whatever. And, and um, you know, um, I think my junior year, I volunteered myself for continuation high school. So I'd only have to go in the mornings. And um, so I was doing that. And, and um, I, I felt like, man, I got a grip on this. I can do this, right? And so my senior year rolls around and the principal calls me in her office and, and she's got this paper in front of her and it's got my name and a bunch of writing and stuff. And, and uh, she's like, uh, sit down, Adrian. And I was nervous, right? Because I knew I was in trouble and I didn't know what I did this time. And um, she's like, uh, you're supposed to graduate this year. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, but you don't have no credits. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then she says, uh, she surprised me, right? She says, but we don't want you here. And I'm like, what does that mean? And she's like, we're going to make sure you graduate. And I didn't know whether to be offended or flattered at that point. 
And so um, I left that, that meeting with very mixed feelings. And um, that same day, it just so happened that the recruiter was there. And this gentleman, uh, you know, he had the hat on and the, and the high and tight. And back in the, in the 80s, like everybody had long hair and rock and roll. And and, um, and so this guy had all the girls around him and he had a clipboard. And, and, and back at that time, like if you had a clipboard, like you were an important person, you know. <laughs> it was like an iPad or something, right? And he's writing stuff down and, you know, all the girls are around. And, and you know, and I'm like trying to figure out what's going on. And, 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 um, and he's like, hey, Hugh, what's your name? I'm like, Adrian Valdez. And he looks at me and he's like. Oh, you're going to graduate? And I'm like, yeah, they just told me. <laughs> and he's like, uh, you ever been to Germany? I'm like, homie, we pick onions around here in the summertime, man. We don't go to Germany or nothing. And he's like, uh, you want $4,000? And I'm like, that's 8,000 sacks of onions. Hell yeah, I want that money. <laughs> and he's, uh, well, sign up for the army and I'll make sure you get that. And so I was like, cool, man, I'm signing up for the Army. But I was still 17 at the time, and uh, we had to go talk to my dad because uh, I wasn't old enough. And, and so he set up an appointment, called my dad, and and uh, he picks me up at my aunt's house, and we drive to my parents' house. And, and uh, it's my dad and my mom and me and the recruiter, and it's a round table. And, um, you know, he's like, Mr. Valdez, you know, your son wants to join the Army, and, um, you know, you don't have to worry about nothing, right? Once he goes in the Army and you sign this paper, like, he'll be a ward of the government. We'll take care of him. You know, we're going to whip him into shape. He's going to learn how to run. On Mars, have respect, dress, we're going to cut off his hair, like, it's going to be amazing. You know, my dad's looking at him like this, right? And uh, so, he, like, he runs, you know, he throws a spill, and he's, he's got the paper, and he signs it, and he's sliding it across the table, and I don't know when it crossed this imaginary line, but when it did, my dad did, like, throw it, right? He gave it back to him real quick, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, he really wanted me to go, you know? And so, uh, July 19, 1989, like, uh, I, went, I went to boot camp in South Carolina, and, um, I don't know. Things changed, right? There was no liquor store. There was no drug connect. There was no homies. There was no streets of Calipad. It was just like a barracks, a bunch of green grass, a drill sergeant, and a couple other dummies that didn't know what was going on either. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you guys seen Forrest Gump, but that's kind of how it went down, right? Like they, uh, you know, they taught me all these things, right? Like they woke me up at five in the morning, you know, made me wear this green uniform, and you know, they made me run, they made me do push-ups, they made me eat some different food, they made me, you know, learn how to take apart a rifle, make a bed, you know, clean a bathroom, and make another bed and I don't like and for like eight weeks like that's all it was and I lost a bunch of weight man I got into shape my asthma wasn't bothering me I started feeling good you know and then we went to this training and you know they made us hike 24 miles and do all this stuff and like I started to have confidence like I never had confidence before you know I never really felt like nothing all you know my whole childhood I felt kind of grimy inside because I had some things happening I didn't know how to deal with and so now I'm in the army and I'm being all I can be and I remember uh at the end of my training right like like they say man like now you're a killer and I'm like hell yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> got this and um you know that Christmas I came home for leave and, and um like I was feeling great I um I, I'd never felt this good. I'd never felt this confident. I've never felt so accomplished. Or, and I remember my dad took me out to dinner and, and, and he introduced me to all his friends and like, this is my son. And I was like, man, that felt so good, right? And so after that dinner, man, like the best thing I could do is I call my boy Flacco. Hey, Flacco, what are you doing tonight? Let's go party. That's like the best I can do after this amazing experience. Like, I just can't handle it. And so I was home for two weeks. I maybe seen my mom once or twice. And, and my, you know, a couple of times I seen my dad, he gave me that look like, and it just reinforced the feelings that I'd always had inside of me, right? Like, I'm just no good. And, um, you know, he said, like, man, you're going to mess this up, man. Like, you know, and, and um, I didn't. But I, I, I understood what he was saying. And so January of that year, I, I got on an airplane, and uh, they sent me to Germany. Now, we can stop and take inventory real quick. Um, I've never been nowhere. I've never had nothing. I don't know anything. Like I, I, I've never had a balance of checkbook. Like I, I I'm already like a, a, a alcoholic slash drug addict. My worst character trait ever is that I'm a know-it-all, and um, and then they put me in a foreign country and I became homesick. Um, they had these things over there. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're called clubs. <laughs> Can't handle a club. Uh, you know, they gave me money, made it legal for me to drink. 
And if you're from California and you're in Europe, like you get a VIP card, right? Like everybody wants to know about California. And, and they'll ask you questions like, have you ever been to Disneyland? And, and, and I don't want to ruin their idea of what it's like and tell them I grew up picking onions, right? And so I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah, man, I, I, I live across the street from Disneyland, you know? And, um, and so I'm in Germany and, 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 um, I'm doing the best I can and like the best that I can looks like, um, I'm spending all my money at the club drinking every night man um you know I, I come up with this insane idea that I'm, I'm gonna you know buy uh you know alcohol and tobacco on the post because it's tax-free and sell it to the germans and so i'm supposed to make all this money it's not working out and i'm always broke and and um i'm homesick i can't like I, i'm just not functioning well and within a year's time like i catch a a drug case over there i'm in a city jail in kitzingen germany trying to figure out what happened and and and, and basically what had happened is i had caught up to myself you know, like they say, wherever you go, and there I was in jail trying to figure out how to get out of this mess. And, and some MPs came and they took me back on post. And I would really was never happy to see the police until that time. But I was that day. And uh, they took me back on post. I, they court-martialed me. I got kicked out. And I got to come back home. And and, um, and once again, right, I'm a failure. And um, in a small town, like, um, you know, before everybody would, like, take me in, and, and, and now I'm a young man, and I, I, I screwed up a golden opportunity, and, 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 you know, like, all my family members would be like, yeah, you can stay a day or two, but you got a road, champ. And so I hit the streets, right? And, and um, you know, I... I um, I don't know, man. I started doing petty crimes. Um, ended up in jail. Uh, the first time was 90 days. Um, and that seemed like it was forever. Little did I know what the future held, right? But uh, it was a lot of MTV. It was a lot of hot cereal in the morning, a lot of dominoes, spades, um, a lot of boredom. Um, I didn't like it. I got out from that one and, and um, vowed never to do it again. I had this insane idea that I was just, you know what, I'm just going to sell drugs. I'm not going to do anything else, right? And um, so I got out, and that was my plan. And so um, I only had one customer. <laughs> And I don't pay. I don't have a job, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I used to front myself dope all the time, man. <laughs> and um, I just, you know, I, I started this cycle, and, and, and um, it carried on for about 20 years. And, and, and uh, basically, uh, you know, I went back in for six months, got out for six months, went in for a year, got out for six months, went in for a year again, got out for two months, went in for 10 years, got out for six months, you know, went in for three years, got out for a month, and and and... and you know, from the time I was 19 till the time I was 39, I, I, I think I spent two Christmases and one Thanksgiving on the streets. Um, and um, I remember turning 25 and I was sitting in the county jail. My cousin Michael, we grew up two months apart. He was born uh, July. I was born in September, maybe three. I don't know, whatever. But um, I'm 25. I'm doing a year in the county. He's 25. He's got two kids, just bought a house. And um, I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> Like, how, how do you stick around to be able to put something like that together? You know, and, 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 and it, it was mind boggling to me, like, cause I, I just, I just couldn't see myself putting anything together. Like, I, I, I honestly felt like I had a guardian devil. Um, and, um, I just was never going to be able to hold down a job or do anything right. Like, um, you know, I, I often joke around and say that, like, if I was an X man, like, my superpower would be that everything I touched turned to crap, right? <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was crazy, man. And so, um, you know, I, I lived my life in and out of jail, in and out of prison. And, 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 and every time I got out, like, I felt like I was further and further away from that, that point where I started getting separated from where I thought I should be. And, um, you know, I wanted sobriety. Like, I wanted something different, but I, I, I just could never make it happen, you know. And, and um, so I get locked up uh, December 24, 1997. Um, my mother's dying of cancer. Uh, she's, uh, sitting in the couch in the living room and, um, she's looking frail and, and, uh, she started losing her hair from the chemo. And I said, I'll be right back. I never seen her again. Uh, she, I ended up catching a case with the feds. I, I got locked up for 10 years and, um, that 10 years kind of changed everything for me. Right. Um, the fact that I lost my mother during that 10 years and the fact that I was gone for 10 years, um, you know, kind of screwed me up. And so I get out in 2007 and, and, um, you know, I'm scared. I'm scared. Technology happened. 
I didn't know what a uh, Bluetooth was. I didn't know what a, uh, you know, this kid had a PSP and he was watching a movie. I was on the Greyhound coming home and I'm like, I started crying because like I, that's how long I was gone. You know, people can now watch movies on this thing about this big. Uh, the whole menu at Mac and Donald's had changed. Yeah. Um, I was at this halfway house on Boston Avenue right here in San Diego, and they told me, go to NASCAR and apply for a job, right? And I walk in, and I'm like, I'm ready. And I'm like, I'm here to apply for a job. And they're like, yeah, just get on the computer and go apply. And I'm like, I'm leaving. Thank you, though. <laughs> I've never seen the Internet. I don't know what any of this is, man, and this this computer and this technology and all this stuff. And, you know, and everybody's like, you know, I'm afraid to ask because they look like they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, what do you mean you don't know what an Internet is? Or, you know, and so, like, um, after 10 years, like, I, I, I wanted something different, and, 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 and all these things were happening, and I just wasn't equipped to handle it once again. And um, the best thing I could do was I started selling drugs at the halfway house and caught another case, and I got locked up for three more. And so now I get out, and it's late 2009, and, and, and I'm ready. Like, I've never been so ready, right? The youngsters in prison are starting to call me Pops and OG and, you know, and I'm like, Ugh, you know, and, and I'm starting to feel it, you know, and so... um me by myself, without AA, without God, without you guys, without a big book, without anything, you know, I said, like, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to get sober, man. I'm, I'm done. So I get a job at the shipyards. I get a promotion. I get a little raise. Like, I'm, I'm doing great. Like, everything is looking on paper. It's looking amazing for somebody in my situation, right? And um, me by myself, I'm good for 65 days. That's with everything that I got. And, and, and... I remember I was on board the, it was on the Ronald Reagan and, and, and I was having a bad day and I still don't remember what was bad about it, but, uh, somebody was in one of the compartments doing this, something they shouldn't have been. And I remember pulling back the plastic and I look inside, outside. I look inside, outside, I'm like, scoot over chap, there's room for two in here, right? And I went on one more run and, and, um, it lasted about six months and, and, um, ended up catching a violation, man. And I get out again and, and, um, they gave me a new PO and this lady, uh, I'm super thankful to her, and I, I, I've let her know. I, I never thought I'd say thank you to a PO, but, um, you know, I get out, and um, she, she tells me, she's like, look, you got sent to a drug program in 1999. It's now 2010. Uh, you're going. And I'm like, and the truth was is that I didn't think AA would work. I didn't think a program would work. My own truth was that everything I'd ever tried had failed. Not just failed, but, I mean, it failed in a big way, right? And um, I remember sitting in prison when I was doing the 10 years and somebody would go home and they'd come back and I'd be there. And, and we have these like profound questions that we ask somebody when they come back to prison, right? What happened, dog? <laughs> 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 and it's always the same, man. Like I always hear this repeatedly, right? Like, like I got out, man. They made me do a, they made me go to a halfway house and they made me do some meetings and I ended up catching a case. And I'm like, man, I could do that without AA. I don't need AA to catch a case. Like, I'm good. And and so that's all I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous was that it didn't work. And so, um, you know, she's telling me, you got to go to a drug program. I'm like, <sighs> And she says that if you, I don't go out, you know, I got 60 days. I got 60 days to get in a drug program. And if I don't go to a drug program, I'm going back to prison. And I, and I was getting tired of prison. It took 20 years, but I was getting tired of prison. And um, I was like, okay. So I ended up in a program downtown. I um, I lied to get into this program. I begged. I, I made a couple moves or whatever. Um, and I'm in this program. And, and I remember going to a meeting. My first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting was on 16th and Market downtown. It's right by Skid Row. Um, I go to this meeting. And um, these two ladies get in a fight at the coffee pot. <laughs> and I'm like, I knew it. <laughs> this doesn't work. And... Um, you know, they kept dragging me to meetings. Uh, when you're in a program, they got this blackout period. There's always somebody with you, which is what I needed. And um, I still didn't believe. Like, I was like, nah, this thing going to work for me. Like, it might work for somebody, but but it's going to only work for those people who are different from me. Like, like, maybe they weren't sexually mishandled, or maybe they're not institutionalized, or maybe they already believe in God, or or maybe, you know, maybe they're not as bad as I was, or, or they didn't drink like I did, or they didn't use like I did, or something. But it's not going to work for me. It'll work for all of them. And um, and that's how I felt, right? And they kept dragging me to these meetings and dragging me to these meetings. And, and um, so I was at this one meeting about two weeks into this day at this program, and, and, and um, the craziest thing happens, right? Somebody I knew from the prison walks into the meeting, and um, and he looked great, right? And um, 
I'm like, what's up, dog? You know, give me some love. And woo, woo, woo. You know, and he sit down, man. He starts telling me how he's doing. And, and, um, and this man had everything that I wanted. You know, and they say in AA that if somebody has what you want, go do what they do, right? And what I wanted was pretty simple. He'd been out of prison more than six months. He had a job. He had a car. And he had an apartment. And I felt like if I could just get those things together, like my life would be so amazing, right? And so I'm like, hey, how are you doing? And he, this is what he says. He says, I'm doing AA. And I'm like, man, get out of here, man. We don't do AA, homie. Like, what's up, man? Like, we don't get down like that. And he's like, no, nah, I'm doing it. I'm like, ah, never mind. And so I turned my back on him, right? And I went back to the program. And then they took me to another meeting. And he was there. And they took me to another meeting. And he was there. And I started having this inkling idea that maybe, just maybe he's doing AA. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find a motive for him to be at the meetings, right? Like, there ain't no money. There ain't no drugs. You know, he's married, so that's not the women. Like, what is he doing in these meetings? You know? And so I'm like, well, maybe he's doing it. And so uh, my ego tells me that if he can do it, I can do it better. You know? And so being who I was at that time, like I did... I did AA. And what that looked like was I followed him around. I did the meetings that he did. If, if you know, he was doing H&I, like I went and did H&I. You know, if they want to go hear somebody speak, like let's go hear somebody speak. You know, like whatever it was that he was doing, I was going to do. And um, and I got to stay sober, right? And 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 I was in this program. They did some steps there that are, are, are based on AA, but they're not AA steps. And those kind of helped too. And so I, I got separated from alcohol. I started doing like a bunch of meetings, probably like 10 to 15 a week, um, just hung out with sober people, worked like as long as I could, every day, 10, 14 hours if I could, and um, I stayed sober for a year, and and what that looked like, at one year, uh, being in AA without actually doing the real work of AA, is that um, I got blessed, I got blessed with a job at a major car dealership with like 20-something felonies, pretty amazing. Um, and so, you know, being the person that I am in recovery, uh, I was embezzling gas money, stealing petty cash. I was still uh, floor mats from the cars, tools from the mechanics. Um, you know, I would punch in and then go eat breakfast and come back. Um, you know, I got blessed with a set of apartments to manage. And so I raised the rent, kept extra money because that's what I do. Um, you know, the promises, they're coming true. And, um... <laughs> I was in a relationship. Check this one out. This is beautiful, right? This is beautiful. I would lie when the truth would do better. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, right? And I tell you guys that because I got, um, I got sober, but I hadn't changed anything. I hadn't did no work on myself, and so I was acting the same. I was doing the same things, and I was basically getting the same results, except this time I was actually a little bit sober, so there was no police involvement. You know, and, and, um, and, and um, at the end of one year, like, I was miserable. Um, I had a lot of chaos around me and, uh, I just wasn't happy, man. And I was in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and this gentleman was sharing about his experience and, and, um, in his share, he convinced me that he knew what I was feeling right now and that he didn't feel that way anymore. He was talking about having a serenity and a peace about him in a way that I was like blown away. Like, is that real? You know, cause, um. Uh, like, if you guys have been sober and you've gotten to do the steps, you know that you thought you knew what happiness was until you found a different level of happiness. And so, like, this 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 thing that he was talking about, like, was intriguing to me. And so I pull him over after the meeting, right? And I told him everything I just told you guys. I'm like, hey, Slim, man, like, I need some help, man. He's like, what's up? I'm like, man, like, I'm doing AA, man. I'm doing meetings, H&I, you know, and then, but then I got this other stuff going on, like, at the car dealership. Like, I'm stealing everything, and I'm lying, and, you know, in the apartments, and this and that. And he's like, well, are you doing the steps? I'm like, man, I do them in my head every day. And he's like, you can't sponsor yourself. <laughs> and I'm like, well, well, what's up? And, you know, and, and, and you know, he, he made it pretty easy, man. He says, look. Pick a day and we'll meet at Lestats that day every week and we'll just, we're going to read the book and when it says pray, we're going to pray and when it says write, we're going to write. You know, I was like, well, I don't believe in God. He's like, I don't care. We're just going to do what it says. I'm like, cool. So that's what we did. We met at Lestats every week on Wednesday and for an hour or two we read and when the book said pray, we prayed and when it said write, I wrote. And um, I still don't remember where I did the fifth step. Um, but I remember, like, uh, when we got to the fourth step, uh, he's like, all right, man. He got a piece of paper, drew some lines. This is what you write here. This is what you write here. This is what you write here. Don't worry about the fourth. We'll do it together. Uh, call me when you're done. I'm like, we're not meeting on Wednesday. He was like, nah, for what? You got work to do. 
And um, I just want everybody to know that if you haven't done the steps, like it took me almost three months to do about four hours worth of work. <laughs> Literally. And, um, but I did it. I did it in like three minute increments. And um, <laughs> I called him. I'm like, hey, Jason, like, I, I, I think I'm done. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, cool. He goes, I'm going to go pick you up. And so he picked me up, and, and I, I don't know. Somewhere's in Mission Valley. We we're just driving. He's like, I think this is, he goes, like, I think this is a good spot. He just pulled over. And he's like, all right, let me have it. I'm like, right here? And he's like, yeah, right now. I'm like, cool. And I pull out these papers. It was like three papers with big writing, and they had food stains, a couple of tear stains, and some, like, well, you know, like a, like a watermark on it from a cup. And, and he's just looking at me, right? And I'm like, I'm opening this up, hoping the paper doesn't rip. And I give it to him. And um, I expected, this is what I expected. I expected him to judge me. I expected him to, to like say, what? You know, like, <laughs> I expect, I don't know, man, like, I don't know why I expected that, but I expected something different than what happened, man. I told him everything that I, you know, didn't want to tell anybody that I'd been holding on to for a long time. I, um, I told him some things that I did to people that um, I'm highly embarrassed about. I told him, I told him what I thought, you know, I'd never told anybody before. And, and, um, and he just said, like, man, that's it. That's all you got. And I was like, I can make some stuff up. But I... <laughs> and, um, you know, he told me to go home and meditate for an hour. And that was the longest 45 minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was brutal. And, um, you know, I said a prayer, man, and, and I started making amends. And, and um, amends are crazy, right? You never know what you're going to get. Like, um, you know, I, I, I went in and made amends to my sister. And my sister's like, just don't move back here no more. Like, just stay where you're at. You know, we don't, like, we're good. And, um, you know, my dad, he was like, uh, we'll see. You know, the, the manager at the car dealership, um, this one was kind of funny, right? This is who I am. This, you'll have a great insight as to my character, right? I'm like, hey, Bob, I need to talk to you. He's like, what's up, Adrian? You know, and <laughs> I'm like, you know that AA thing I keep talking about? He's like, yeah, tell me about it. I'm like, well, part of the process is making amends. And, and so if I've done somebody wrong, like, I have to make it right. And so uh, you remember when you used to send me to L.A. Um, to do the dealer trades? And he's like, yes. I'm like, when I used to give you the gas receipt and I used to ask you to sign it so I could go get reimbursed? Yes. I'm like, those, those receipts were fake. I, I, uh, I used to just get them and then I'd have you sign them because uh, I, I, I wanted the money. And he's like, well, I knew that. <laughs> and he says, uh, I used to do that because I couldn't pay you more on your check and I wanted you to be, make it and I wanted you to be okay. But if you can't handle it, don't do it no more. <laughs> and, and, and so then what happened is I got a resentment because I thought I was being slick. <laughs> And evidently, I was there, and he took that from me. <laughs> and so I had to do some more writing. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, made, I made other amends, man, the owner of the apartments, and, and you know, I paid everybody, and, and um, like, things changed, right? Like, at that point, I remember prior to that, like, uh, you know, they used to tell me, like, hey, Adrian, like, you need, you, need, you need to go meditate. Like, meditate? He's like, yeah, man, you need to meditate. I'm like, man, what does that look like? I'm like, man, you just need to hear, you need to listen for God. I'm like, all right, I'll try whatever, you know. And so uh, I remember they sent me to Sunset Cliffs. And so I get out of the car, man, I climb down, I'm on the rocks, and, and the waves are coming in, man, the sun's getting ready to go down, and it's beautiful out there, right? Nobody out there. And I sit down, man, I find me a comfortable rock, and I sit down, man, and I'm just checking everything out. And they told me to just close my eyes and try to soak everything in, man. Just relax and try to just, just, just relax. And so I close my eyes. And the first thing that comes up is Pawn Stars on. The car needs gas. I haven't did laundry. I don't even have any quarters. When do I get paid? I think Pawn Stars is on. Uh, you know, and, and, <laughs> and my mind's going crazy, right? And, and there's a dude, man, like a few rocks down. And he's just sitting there and I get mad at him. Because I feel like he's doing it. 
and I'm not. <laughs> and so I started making these amends, man, and, and, and I feel like, um, at least for me, the way it happened is, is, is you know, I, I go through life and I, and I do people wrong things, and so every time they're around, like, I get these voices in my head. Like, if I stole my man's wallet, every time he's around me, like, I get a voice from this side that says, I wonder if he knows. And the one up here says, he doesn't know. And the one over here says, why is he looking at me like that? And the other one over here says, he's just waiting to tell you. And then the other one, he knows. No, he doesn't. And so if I go through life with all this stuff going on, like, I got a bunch of noise up here, man. And so once I start making amends, I'll be like, hey, Slim, remember when I was helping you look for that wallet? I knew where it was at, man. And I'm making amends, try to make it right, and, and, and I don't have to hear those voices. And so I, I started making all these amends, and then, like, um, I remember being able to drive with no music on, like, was the first thing I noticed. You know, and that was kind of crazy. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, and, and things kind of calmed down, and I started to experience a little bit of what this guy that, uh, that I had asked for help was talking about. And then, um, you know, after that, uh, I don't know, life got a little bit different, right? And some of the promises, as they say, started to happen, and then, um, you go to step 10, and step 10 for me, um, you know, I do like a bi-monthly inventory, sometimes quarterly. I, I don't really do a daily one. I'm still working on that. Normally, I do inventory when things get bad, which is, uh, I don't know. That's something that I still struggle with. I don't really feel like uh, at the end of the night, like I want to retire like the book says. I really just want to go to sleep. <laughs> And same thing when I wake up in the morning, like I'm certainly learning how to wake up because uh, I still struggle with these things. But, um, you know, I do the best that I can. You know, the prayer and meditation uh, was hard for me as well um, up until about, I want to say, six months ago. Like I, I never really felt like I had a tangible experience with, with God. Um, but I stuck around in AA and some, some, some things happened and uh, I now believe. And so um, prior to that, like, I felt like I was talking to myself when I prayed. And usually the only times I prayed were in meetings. And um, it never really, like, it was just by rote, right? Like, you know, surrender your prayer. Uh, okay, bye. And um, that was just my experience, you know. And, and up until recently, like, I, I really started to feel some uh, something from from this prayer. And so, um, you know, it took me it took me what it took me. But I feel like I got it right now. And uh, step 12 for me is... Um, I don't know. I feel like that's where it's at. You know, people ask me about this this, this process in AA, and I feel like um, the process is uh, we want you to have a spiritual experience, and in order to sustain it, we want you to work with people, and and, and there's a process involved in it. And, um, you know, I remember coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was in a meeting, and this lady was talking about, you know, at the end of every workday, she goes around looking for stray dogs to take them home and, and, and heal them and find them homes. And I remember thinking, like, man, like, who has that type of love left over at the end of the day? I sure don't. Like, I can't imagine. Like, I just can't imagine that, right? And, and some of my first experiences uh, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous doing service work was when I was in this program, they'd say, like, all right, we're going to go clean this lady's yard. I'm like, how much she paying? <laughs> For free? You know, I, I, I didn't get it, man. But um, having been able to stick around, at first I, I did it because they told me. And then, um, you know, some of my biggest joys in life now are, are involved with doing service in Alcoholics Anonymous. Some of it involves like H and I. Some of it involves sponsoring. Some of it involves giving people rides. Some of it involves listening to people. Like it's just it's 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 different things. But ultimately, um, you know, I feel like uh, got it. If um, if it wasn't for the service side of this thing, like I wouldn't still be here. You know, if I would have did the, you know these steps and 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 and, and felt good, like I would have just you know like I'm good and just went home. I wouldn't still be here. Like, I, I wouldn't have none of the things that I have right now. And um, I don't know, man. Uh, it's just a joy now. I, I really get a lot out of helping people and, and sticking around in Alcoholics Anonymous. And because of that, I feel like I've gotten exposed to things that I really needed and didn't know that I needed. Like, you know, like friendships, uh, um, relationships, you know, uh, church, like all these things. Like, I would have never gotten to do any of these things if I had just been minding my own business, working and going home every day. And so, uh, yeah, man, uh, I think that's it for tonight. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.